Freedom HealthWorks is the direct primary care accelerator. We help doctors across the country start fresh in direct primary care. With Freedom HealthWorks, you work with a team, not a checklist. Visit freedomhealthworks.com and together we can achieve true freedom in direct care. So Dr. Smith, first question's headed your way. What exactly happened these past few months in your opinion? You know, I'm not sure. I think um, I, I think there's so much uncertainty um, when when the people in the United States are are listening to to folks in government speak. They they've learned lesson over the years uh, to understand that in all likelihood they're dealing with known liars. Uh, I like. I like the old Lou Rockwell quote that you don't know anything is true and for certain until the government issues its official denial. And so the true casualty, uh, not to belittle the, the amount of, of death and carnage, uh, true death from COVID and then economic death from government, but one of the real, I would say, unrecognized uh, casualties in this disaster has been the truth. And, and I I think it's hard for people to know what is true uh, and uncertainty uh, makes people crazy. I mean, uncertainty is very, very difficult. Uh, the human mind, uh, to quote my, my wife's old boss, John Nichols, who founded Devon Energy, the, the human mind is, is capable of absorbing even the worst of news, uh, but it has real difficulty uh, with uncertainty. Sure. So, um, I, I don't actually know what to believe. Um, people have asked me, what do I think? And all I can tell them is how is my method, uh, my means of zeroing in on what I feel is most likely true and accurate. And the first thing that I do is that if, uh, if anyone is speaking and they actually are paid by or work for government, I discard all that they say. Uh, I, I'm not saying that later on they might actually be proven to be true, but my default is to disbelieve them uh, because history is on my side in assigning some diabolical agenda uh, to them. Uh, the next thing that I do is I look for people who are speaking whose message places their entire career uh, and fortune in jeopardy. So w when someone is not not just floating downstream with the comfortable narrative of hysteria, and when they actually have something to say uh, that I think may place their future career or whatever research grants that they have in their future, uh, when those people speak, I tend to listen more because they are not opportunists uh, by definition. They have nothing to gain. Uh, they're just so tormented by their, uh, by their desire to, to tell what they believe is truth. That, that's true passion and truth typically that comes out. Um, so those are my, the two things that I do and I look at what's left uh, and then try to discern uh, what is true. Uh, I think it's interesting that there were fatality numbers, mortality rates that were quoted early on with this mm -hmm. virus without actually uh, there being any testing available. So I don't know how you quote a rate without a denominator. And I think many people were uh, very confused by that. And I think there were many variables like uh, pre-existing comorbidities that that were right. not taken into account. You know, the ab I, somebody told me the other day the average age of death in Italy was over 81 years old. So that was not made clear. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, I don't know what's been going on. I do know uh, government never gets anything right. And I don't think they've gotten this right. So thanks to the government, we not only have uh, a lot of uh, dead people, we also have uh, an economy that they, the government has assassinated. So you know, we actually have the worst of all worlds, uh, in my opinion. So um, I, I think that in a conversation I had with Jay Kempton the other day, and James is on the call, Jay made the point that, uh, you know, when the chips are down, people turn to the free market. And I, I had joked that, you know, all these regulations that are present to keep us safe um, astonishingly had to 
be set aside in order for us to be safe. <laughs> and, and Jay made the point that, yeah, and when the chips are down, people turn to the, to the free market, whether it's Elon Musk providing ventilators on short notice. You know, General Motors was actually able to turn their plan around, I believe, and create some ventilators when actually yep. that's what people thought was needed. Yep. So what, what's happened is hopefully, hopefully people realize uh, the government can't get anything right. Uh, they, they are perhaps even diabolical. Uh, and they also will have an appreciation for um, the response to this insanity compared to what it might have been in a, in a country like Venezuela that, that does not have a market full of entrepreneurs able to respond uh, to the needs of consumers. So I'm, I, am, I remain optimistic that this disaster uh, creates an opportunity uh, for for those who wish wish to supply the needs and wants of consumers. Uh, but I I uh, I did not think I could think less or despise government more or have more contempt for government than I did prior to COVID nineteen. But I was wrong. You mentioned uh, regulations in place to keep us safe, but then again, it sounds like you're saying the regulations were in place to stifle safety. Is that fair? Yeah, and, and I mean, I think about all of the regulations that have been suspended, uh, whether it has to do with uh, restaurants able to send a bottle of wine out the door for takeout. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these regulations have been set aside. Uh, there are um, regulations that have been set aside by the FDA and, and many others so that you know, people can actually receive what they need. Um, and it, I just think it's ironic that you know, these regulations meant to, meant to keep us safe or all set aside so we can be safe. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get into some of the more specifics about those regulations and easing those and what that has meant for uh, consumers and, and uh, healthcare workers in general here in a few minutes. But, you know, James, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, as leader of the Free Market Medical Association, you interact with a lot of different um, stakeholders, uh, as I'll call it, in the industry. So I want to hear you know, what specific changes did the FMMA make once, um, you know, as Dr. Smith mentioned, you know, the entire U.S. economy was basically shut down and stay-at-home orders were issued? Yeah, well, I'd like to maybe tag on to what Dr. Smith was saying uh, to add that this entire crisis has really shined a spotlight on the fact that the thing that we've been saying for a long time, which is that the healthcare system is very, it's overregulated and uh, over centralized. And for me, I've, I guess I've realized more and more that all of our economy for the most part is overregulated and over centralized. I mean, we have food shortages that seem to be coming because the supply chains are very, you know, convoluted and uh, highly regulated in the, in the food industry. And then also in healthcare and, you know, from a free market medical association perspective, people like Dr. Smith and our members have been, really working in almost like a counter counter economy to that, creating a free market, a decentralized approach. So for me, what this does is just highlight the fact that we need more of that and less of what the existing structure is with um, hospital, the hospital systems being so centralized and the, the employee based uh, model has really, uh, <clears throat> started falling apart like a house of cards because of what Dr. Smith said that the government's done and the reaction to the um, COVID-19, they were, they basically have um, taken a lot of the revenue stream away from hospitals and, and which we're now seeing that a lot of that was from elective quote elective uh, procedures that are completely gone now. So, you know, the Free Market Medical Association, our members have been operating in that space uh, for a long time and I think have really good solutions for moving forward. And it seems like a lot of the FMMA members are you know, really pioneers in the terms of telehealth or being able to be um, as accessible as possible for their patients, for their members. Something that <clears throat> this type of a pandemic and this type of a crisis really drove home that 
most what we're going to call uh, traditional healthcare systems uh, just weren't able to adapt to that. Now, uh, wanted to ask you, you mentioned elective procedures. So I wanted to see, you know, Dr. Smith, what was the impact from your surgery center uh, when your state was shut down, stay at home orders uh, issued and how those, so really a two part question. So how was your surgery center impacted? And then those elective surgeries when the hospitals are no longer able to perform those, how does that affect them? And how does that affect the people that work for them? So first of all, you know, how was your surgery center impacted? Well, we, we were impacted drastically. I mean, um, almost everything that we do here is elective. However, there are, there are a fair number of procedures we perform that uh, we would all agree are in the urgent spectrum. So while the hospitals um, and the health department initially decided that they were going to define um, these, uh, these categories, uh, in these overarching groups that applied to a herd of millions of people, uh, we decided true to our mission that every definition of urgency would be based on individual circumstances. So for instance, um, the uh, nerve uh, issue in a patient's upper extremity uh, would not be considered uh, as an urgent case by by anybody that is a central planner handing down these edicts, but in someone who only has one arm, we we considered that very differently, and we actually had a patient like that. So mm -hmm. on a case by case basis, we decided uh, that we would treat um, people as individuals, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what government does. Government treats us all as members of the herd uh, and they, they keep <laughs> they using the word herd yeah yeah and, and human beings are individuals uh, we do not see them as members of groups um, and so the effect on us was to remove about 90 percent of, um, of what we could do here on a daily basis uh, we are we're a big enough institution and had enough cash reserves we could withstand this as well or better really than some of the hospital systems around uh, but there would be many surgery centers across the united states that will struggle with this or perhaps not even survive right right one 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 point i want to make uh, to tag on to james and talking about relaxing these regulations you're hearing people all over the country talking about relaxing certificate of need laws you now these certificate of need laws were put into place to prevent surgery centers and hospitals from opening. And you even had Alex Azar, uh, the head of HHS, talking about suspending the prohibition of physician-owned hospitals and physician-owned facilities. So there, this, this, as far as I'm concerned, um, that's all talk. But I think it's interesting. That's a conversation that uh, people have been waiting for for a long time. So, you know, to to keep this all safe, you know, we have to remove the regulations that that prevent facilities from coming into being and preventing physicians from owning them. And and all almost all the facilities that are part of the Free Market Medical Association are are physician owned. And I think they've all been drastically affected uh, by the government's very arbitrary decision to uh, to shut down elective procedures. One one other point I'd like to make while you hear the hospitals. Uh, saying they're going broke and furloughing all these people. They're all receiving hundreds of millions of dollars of bailout money. Um, and in the state of Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Hospital Association actually opposed the governor's decision to open up elective surgeries again. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you interpret this other than that they, they have so many cash reserves. Uh, they're hoping for more time to use those reserves while they know that smaller independent facilities cannot cope with the suspension of elective surgeries for long, and they can just basically choke them out. So there, there is a lot, there's a lot that's going on. There's a lot that's not being said. And I'm not a huge Dinesh D'Souza fan, but his question is, what are they not telling us? And I, and I think that, that that needs to be answered. I'm not sure it ever will be, but, but I think there's a lot that is not being said, uh, that we are not being told, 
I think there's a lot there that the people that are in in charge of managing this disaster are not uh, telling the American people. You mentioned bailouts. I just read right before uh, this interview that the Los Angeles Lakers received a <laughs> received a bailout or part of their uh, uh, paycheck protection program. So there you go. The LA Lakers of all people of all organizations. Um, Wanted to wanted to be clear, and just so everybody's clear out there, um, what do you mean by elective surgeries? I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page because, you know, I don't want people to think the elective surgeries is a nose job or something else cosmetic. Yeah, so uh, the I believe the decision tree and the chart uh, that's being used is called ESAS. It's elective surgery appropriateness scale. And there, there's a lot of sort of military jargon uh, that has been attached to this. They're calling it the war on COVID. Mm-hmm. And I, in Oklahoma, and I don't know, maybe in other parts of the country, they're calling it Operation Echo, like, like some military operation in Iraq or somewhere. When I turn on the TV, and I, when I, whenever I see a governor at a press conference, he's surrounded by these jarheads in, in military fatigues. And I think it's disgusting uh, to call this a war and to uh, demonstrate the muscle of the state in front of the American people. I think, I think that it's very, very troubling. Um, so you have these, this, this jargon where you have like PPE and ESAS and you have all this stuff nobody nobody really cares about or understands, but ESAS is, is meant to one size fit all describe what is elective and what is emergent and what is urgent. Mm -hmm. And of course it takes into account none of the circumstances of actual individual human beings. It is a cookie cutter approach uh, that you would expect someone in government uh, or frankly in the military to use uh, that does not allow any flexibility at all. So if someone has uh, an aortic aneurysm or they have an aneurysm in their brain, as far as the government is concerned, that is an elective surgery. These are, these are people that could, um, they could have devastating life ending uh, events without the repair uh, of their condition. So it's, uh, it's very arbitrary. Uh, it's typical government. It's, it's as if the, Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles were in charge of, um, of medical care. And I hope people also connect those dots that, that these, uh, these, uh, these fools, these uh, arrogant central planners that, that think that they can, you know, forecast models uh, with numbers that very wrongly predict millions of deaths, uh, that these people uh, feel like they are capable of directing all of United States healthcare uh, should be a lesson to, to everyone that's paying any attention. Yeah. And, and, you know, I agree with you that with the elective surgeries that uh, an aneurysm, I mean, that just strikes me as something that you said life saving that people can't get. So, you know, I, I've seen some people asking that where, where do people that used to come in with the heart attacks who need open heart surgery, who need these, um, like you said, these life saving uh, surgeries that are deemed elective, what happened to all those people? Where are they going? They just, it just, it's not like those conditions just stopped happening. What happened to them? Well, my friend, uh, Dr. Dwayne Schmidt, um, here in Oklahoma is a cardiologist and he has, he's described how he felt obligated to tier based on severity and his best guess uh, what patients had critical coronary artery lesions, and he did the best he could in an attempt to comply with this selective surgery edict. But there are people with coronary artery lesions uh, that will have, have difficulty out of proportion to what their lesion actually shows uh, when it is anatomically studied. And, and Dwayne, Dwayne has done a very good job, but he had one patient uh, that he would have performed uh, revascularizing angioplasty on, uh, but whose lesion um, was one of those that was unpredictable and the patient had a life-changing heart attack. And he's, mm-hmm. he's written an article about this. And I, 
I think that um, there there's a real face of resistance. Uh, you know, the Karens in the world are out there tattling on everybody, uh, but there there are some physicians out there that are just the face of the resistance that are continuing to take care of people on an individual basis and ignoring all of these hurting orders uh, that are coming out of government. And, and Dwayne is one of those heroes. Um, I think we are here at Surgery Center of Oklahoma just can, and all we're doing is just considering patients on an individual case by case basis. Well, I, I didn't take an oath for the greater good uh, I mean, I, we took an oath here, all of us as physicians, to take care of individual patients based on the, their condition. So, you know, when government tells us to ignore people uh, and regardless, you know, and use this cookie cutter approach, then we we acknowledge it, but I, I won't say that we followed that uh, appropriate, uh, exactly the way that they want us to. And, and we're not alone. All over the United States, there, there are physicians that have have acknowledged it inside and then done the right thing. Uh, I, and I hope, I hope that all of those people, as time goes by, increasingly feel safe coming out and saying that because the, mm-hmm. the, the Karens in the world that would uh, uh, rat, rat out Anne Frank in the attic, those people are out there and we're, we're seeing who they are. It's almost a social distancing secret police right there. So big shout out to all the Karens in the world. From Dr. Smith. <laughs> um, <laughs> James, I want to, and actually, you know, Dr. Smith, going back to that, I, I think we are uh, acknowledging long overdue uh, those brave men and women of frontline uh, healthcare professionals who are putting their lives on the risk to help treat very, very sick people. So it is great to see that. And I know um, Indiana National Guard and, and uh, is planning a bunch of flybys of, hospitals around the state and in their honor. So, you know, maybe a little bit too late uh, in the grand scheme of things, but I think the spotlight is on the right type of people, uh, like you mentioned there. So, James, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned a lot of people who are not doing so well, um, you know, in different environments and, and focusing more on healthcare workers. Um, what have you been hearing from the FMA members about who is doing well and, and who isn't, um, you know, from independent medicine to those who are employed uh, by hospitals? Yeah, well, I think as we kind of talked about, I mean, FMA, FMMA members have been operating in a, a free market or more of a free market than, you know, the general healthcare population. So DPC, the DPC practices out there were already ahead of the curve when it comes to things like telemedicine. So, um, and they also um, may not have been quite as affected because, you know, they had a membership model in place. So I think it speaks well to what was already being done by FMMA members and why that needs to be expanded. Um, I think, like we've talked about, um, entrepreneurship being such an important uh, role in, in the market. I think the, the opportunity here is for more physician physician entrepreneurs um, and medical workers to take more of an entrepreneurial approach and move away more away from the centralized employee based model that you know we see with the big hospitals. As Dr. Smith said, you know they may they're they're crying a big game that they're losing all this money because of you know COVID nineteen, but we know that the reality is is that they've been overcharging you know patients five ten x for a long time. So a lot of these workers that might be furloughed uh, could be administration administrators, uh, not necessarily the frontline medical workers. So I think we might need to see some a silver lining there that there could be a, a major shakeup in in a positive way. I think we're at a crossroads right now where there will will definitely be people that will calling be calling for more bailouts of the big hospitals, more oversight and overreach by the government in healthcare. You know, as soon as this happened, there were people that were coming out and saying, well, see, this is why we need Medicare for all. But I think we're here sort of on the front lines to say that, no, we could have avoided a lot of this catastrophe if we had followed free market principles and moving forward, maybe the healthcare industry needs a major uh, shakeup. It was on a house of cards or, you know, on 
a ha house built on on sand, kind of like our economy has been in a lot of ways. I think we're that a lot of our economic fragility has been exposed during this because so many businesses uh, and individuals have been up to their eyeballs in debt. And we've talked about um, how the average household doesn't have $400 in a savings account, you know, to pay for medical procedures. So, you know, the businesses that are suffering, we're probably a lot of them living, you know, month to month um, from an economic standpoint. And uh, businesses now, I think, will be looking more and more uh, for ways to uh, move toward what we've been talking about, which is, you know, how can they save money for health care for their employees? So, I think we have a lot of opportunities right now. Uh, we also have, you know, a situation where tr trust is going to have to be rebuilt and for to get patients just to consider going to the doctor again. A lot of, like you were saying, with I think a lot of people are avoiding what uh, avoiding essential care because they have been. Um, told that they have to be afraid to, you know, go to the doctor unless they, you know, think they're dying of COVID-19. So I, a way for that trust to be restored would be for more entrepreneurial uh, people to come and, uh, you know, offer solutions like telemedicine, offer, you know, physician-owned uh, surgery centers like the Surgery Center of Oklahoma that, you know, can really uh, focus on, you know, the trust of the consumer to to have a procedure done, you know, in a place that is safe for them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this will spur, oh, spur a push, spur a movement to decouple insurance from employment? I would I would hope so. I don't know that that's that will you know happen in the short term, but I think we, we definitely hope that that would you know there there's definitely definitely a qual a role for employers to play in maintaining the you know the health and safety of their employees i think outside of of an individual you know my own responsibility for uh, my own health i think you know my employer has a vested interest in making sure that i'm healthy and alive too so i think the market there's a, a market for that um but i i also think that moving forward in this environment you know businesses can play a, a quality role in helping you know manage that for their employees I would just add to that that with you know the record number of unemployment that is going on right now, uh, that will definitely mean that you know we will def we will be hearing a lot more about the number of people who are uninsured through their employer. So this is um, even more opportunity for members of the FMMA, like the DPC model, to be uh, reaching out to those people that need healthcare that might not have insurance cover coverage through their employer. It's going to be a lot of changes being made, obviously with, you know, record unemployment claims, uh, unemployment rates have shot up um, because of layoffs, furloughs, due to an uncertain business environment as we, as we touched upon. Um, so talking about, you know, what, what Dr. Smith had mentioned and, and, and James, you had mentioned earlier that, Early on, out of the gates, the response was, for lack of a better rosier term, completely fumbled. Um, you know, anybody with a pulse understands that we needed masks, face guards, gloves, gowns, uh, you name it for frontline workers. You know, James, what caused such a shortage in this protective gear that were desperately needed in our hospital systems? Well, when, when you talk about uncertainty, you can't plan necessarily far enough ahead to think that you're going to have a, a global pandemic, but you want a system in place, a free market system in place that will allow those demands to be met very quickly. And I think the, as we talked about earlier with uh, regulations with FDA, the FDA and other regulatory agencies having to be inspectors for these masks, that definitely slowed down 
the process. Uh, there were reports of thousands of masks that were in a warehouse just waiting to be inspected by the FDA. It, there are also limit the number of suppliers for this equipment. So in a free market, a company that might make, um, let's say, um, sheets, bed sheets, could quickly modify their business and, because of the demand and start making masks or gowns or whatever. But mm -hmm. that's not allowed for the most part, you know, in a highly regulated economy. Right. Right. So talking more about lifting or changing of regulations, because the snap decision coming out of this was, like you said, there were a lot of inefficiencies that were exposed, whether it is the wait times, delay times, or just um, a massive regulatory hand that is not efficient for getting products in demand to places they need them. So pulled a couple examples out. So things that have actually been positive because of this in medicine, um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid have expanded telehealth payments. Um, again, a lot of people in the direct care community are probably kind of saying, oh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because again, they were already ahead of the curve and CMS is just catching up to telehealth payment models. Um, another one is relaxing HIPAA enforcement and caring for remote patients. So allowing programs like FaceTime, um, Skype, to actually care for people in a virtual setting. Um, another one is, like you mentioned, the FDA's fast-tracking ventilator manufacturing. So allowing for um, companies who don't necessarily you know, manufacture ventilators. Um, Dr. Smith, I believe, mentioned Elon Musk uh, and his company before um, previously in this episode. Uh, another example, FDA allowing personal protective equipment marked for industrial use to be used in hospitals because there isn't a difference between them except one box is labeled hospitals, another is labeled industrial. And so my last example here, and this is my favorite, and this is taken verbatim from the March FDA news release, um, saying that hospitals and healthcare professionals may use ventilators intended for other environments. For example, the guidance notes hospitals that could repurpose ventilators normally used for transporting patients in an ambulance into the hospital setting for long-term use. The FDA also provides recommendations for other alternatives that should be considered, such as devices for treating sleep apnea, continuous positive, you know, sleep apnea, CPAP machines, continuous positive airway pressure uh, devices. Um, and this was just a head scratcher for me thinking, if these are already medical products, why in the world can't hospitals use these to help save lives and help increase the supply of life-saving equipment? So Dr. Smith, um, Previously, you mentioned certificate of need laws, and these are another big area where people are starting to look at. What was your take on, on any type of movement in uh, either getting rid of these type of, of laws or at least easing these restrictions? What part have they played in this current crisis? Yeah, I, I don't know um, how much of the ease of regulations that, that we'll see. I think... Um, I think Dr. Robert Higgs, the scholar at the Mises Institute, is a great guide. Um, his his book, Crisis of Leviathan, um, very clearly uh, descri describes historically how governments have used crises like this to ratchet up uh, regulations. Yeah, so go the uh, other and way. Then, yeah. Uh, in, yeah, and then not in there's not one example in human history where the regulations went actually down to the pre-crisis level. So that he called this the ratchet effect. Um, the, the other thing I would encourage people to consider watching is the, the Mises Institute lecture Dr. Higgs gave called the state is too dangerous to tolerate where he painstakingly uh, reviews uh, the crimes of the food and drug administration um, and we've seen some of what the FDA is is capable of um, in their incompetence uh, and as their uh, tool of big pharma. Uh, they also create the playing field uh, for the liability environment we all uh, live in uh, because uh, Lord help anybody that is in violation of any FDA, FDA or CDC guidelines. So I, I think that that it's interesting that once again, these regulations, you know, in order for us to be safe, have to be waived. Uh, you know, in order for the market unhampered to be able to actually provide 
provide for the wants and needs of patients and consumers. The, the government has to get out of the way. It's, it's kind of a broken record. And I, and I sure hope people see that pattern. Well, even as you were talking about ventilators before, the use of ventilators this was really you know, put out there for physicians in a very top-down, centralized approach. And a lot of physicians were seeing that maybe that wasn't the best solution for, like you said, not the herd, but for the patient, for the individual. And that ventilators you know, were actually hurting more patients than they were helping. But at the same time, the um, government through CMS was handing out big checks to hospitals for these ventilators. So you don't really know if, if the, you know, it's really bad to say that, you know, is the, the um, solution being driven by, you know, profit and money that's being handed out by the government. Yeah. So the, the question here on my mind is if these regulations, um, if easing them or getting rid of them, and, and I just read off a few of them and, and you've had a couple as well, why did they exist in the first place if we're seeing positive results? Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, it's, uh, I think you, you've you it's a rhetorical question, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, we, we know. <laughs> it's not a good way to answer I it. Think, it's just kind of a uh, kind of I shrug think, your shoulders. I think right? the yeah, I mean, the answer is, the answer is pretty obvious. Uh, you know, pity the fool who answers a rhetorical question. I, I think that it's, very obvious the way you say today what the answer is <laughs> yeah yeah well you know what we can only uh have that discussion and keep having it until uh we get the the positive results that we want here so uh kind of in closing here um, um what kind of advice do you have you know for fmma members or any other physicians listening in thinking wow i wonder if now is the time to either join the FMMA or join the direct care movement or think of ways to do better. Um, what's your advice? I, I think that you, you touched on a very important um, possibility, Chris, earlier when you wondered if this was a, an impetus for the breakdown uh, between um, health, health pay, payment for health services and employment. I, I do think that patients are increasingly going to avoid the, the cesspool uh, of infection at hospitals and the, the stain of COVID-19 will remain uh, on the big box hospitals and it will be absent from, uh, from the independent facilities that are primarily physician owned. So, that's a real marketing advantage um, that, that will come naturally as a result of this. So I think that there will increasingly be pressure uh, by employees who are in an, in an employer plan to secure their care away from where the PPO network would otherwise direct them uh, within the family, you know, within the cartel. Uh, I predicted that uh, also, because the hospital, big, big box hospitals are so inefficient that the elective surgery backlogs will not be efficiently dealt with and that people will see waiting lines not unlike the ones seen in socialist uh, uh, countries like uh, Canada. And I think that uh, the American people are an impatient bunch. And I think having been quarantined and boxed into their own house for a while, they're going to be even more impatient. So there's yeah. another reason that these long lines may represent an opportunity for more nipple uh, FMMA member facilities to accommodate uh, the, the needs that patients have. So I, I see that as a possibly a real uh, kind of powder keg moment that may do exactly what I think you were alluding to, and that is a breakdown of this arrangement that the carriers, the employers, and the patients have now with these big box hospitals. And it could all, if everything goes well, it could all completely fly apart. Well, and as you said, Dr. Smith, uh, before, and maybe just a week or two before all this broke out, that, you know, there could be a real possibility that 
you know, a major insurance carrier defects from that model this year. And maybe this is the impetus that they need to do that. Um, also, this could theoretically, you know, I'm not necessarily uh, have tons of hope on this, but uh, theoretically that some entrepreneurial hospital, more entrepreneurial hospital CEOs could realize this, that they need to uh, decentralize their operations, be more transparent and follow uh, some the principles of the free market medical association. So it sounds like potential silver linings, you know, in all the chaos, there's always a rise as an opportunity and, and we'll assess what went right and what went wrong. And again, I, I say this apprehensively, but hopefully we can influence our elected officials and appointed uh, agency heads to make the correct choice going forward. Well, gentlemen, I wanted to thank you for taking time to chat with us today. Uh, wish you the best of luck. Look forward to following all the successes again. Um, James, uh, real quick, uh, unfortunately, we had to postpone the, the FMMA's uh, annual conference. Give us a quick recap of uh, when the new date is. Yeah, we've uh, moved the date for the conference to August the 13th through the 15th. It's going to be in the same location in the Dallas area uh, the same theme that we have chosen before and entrepreneurship and I think it's even more um, appropriate now uh, as a result of this crisis amen to that James Donovan with the Free Market Medical Association Dr. Keith Smith with Surgery Center of Oklahoma thank you both for joining us today it's been a pleasure thanks hi again everyone this is Chris at Healthcare Americana, we're always on the lookout for great stories to tell in the healthcare industry. And we'd like to hear yours. Check out healthcareamericana.com and send us your ideas for episodes or if you'd like to be a guest. Thanks again for listening. Hope you enjoy it.